and you can teach with the likelihood scale like a profession, nobody likes to say they got dumber. Um, it's just something that happens with a scale one to five scale. Um, so we wanted to find new ways to measure growth in uh, professional development. So we truly believe that teacher dispositions are a key indicator to their success um, in being able to use technology. But however, uh, if you haven't read it yet, Lawless and Pilgrino did a great review in RER on um, technology and professional development. And one of the key findings was, well, we gotta get away from self-report surveys because people don't say they get dumber. Um, you want, they want to say that, that, that's, that you know, they got smarter. Um, so we were looking at new ways to kind of measure that and to really capture their dispositions. I mean, oh, I have a four. So that means I'm a, oh, that's, that's a teacher. There's a, they're a four teacher. Um, so we had to look at ways to assess those dispositions. And we took Hiller's idea of visual analogies, and there, I think at some point in my lifetime, there might be a chapter coming out that describes well, this a little bit. Well, the date is 2012 now, unfortunately. Yeah, it was, it was 2005, 2009, 2012. Right. And I mean, at least as a co-author on it. I, oh, that was okay. And um, I have a chapter in that same book. Uh, it will come out eventually before my kids are in college. Uh, <laughs> so we'll have to wait and see. Now, we took this idea of, um, I forgot that we didn't put your name on, I apologize. Um, that uh, Hiller took the ideas of Bailey and Dresden, looking at analogies as being useful in education. Um, and of course, we all know that uh, G warns us of kind of creating these metaphors for teachers. That, you know, you can't label them, you know, we just can't create categories for teacher. Oh, they're an innovator, or they're a this. They're, you know, when we're talking about um, portfolio switchers as a design feature, that we have to really have the teachers reflect on their own analogies, and that's why, and we'll show you an example of what we did. Um, so our research question is basically, did our professional development model affect teacher dispositions toward using technology? And our, we adapted the original model that they created to fit um, the changing needs, and we'll describe that a little bit. So we have 104 participants included in this study. It's over two separate new literacies institutes. We've done it uh, two more years. The first year was 110 teachers that, um, were paid to go, and the second year of 67 teachers who are either paying out of pocket or had to apply for support. So there's a slight difference in teacher for dispositions right away when you're willing to shell out $500 to attend a conference versus getting paid $500 to get a conference. So we did want to note that. Um, out of that sample, we had, 90, we had uh, 93 total teachers who were able to do both the pre and post analogies. How did we change the, um, the model a little bit? Well. Hiller, didn't, Hiller did a great job of introducing it, but the way it works is there's these master classes. We call them digger deeping sessions. And then they had these digital text and tool sessions and then the design studio, three elements every day. Ours, lo and behold, suddenly this thing called the Common Core State Standards came out and suddenly everything had to be connected to that. Um, we actually weren't allowed to use the word test or technology or tool in, during the presentation. Those three words were banned. Um, but so what we did is we looked at what are the elements when you look at online re research and media skills that, that are, that's required in the Common Core, what does that really contain? What is necessary for students to have online research and media skills? And we break it down into three things, online collaborative inquiry, online reading comprehension, and online content construction. So they had digging deeper sessions around each one of those, and then they had digital text and tool sessions which were, con which were connected to a specific Common Core State standard, grade level expectation, and a tool. So it would be like examining multi multiple perspectives with Animoto. It was really about learning how to use Animoto, but we had to put the state standard first. Or, um, and it was good, though. The teachers liked having a pedagogical goal first. Really, it is important. Don't teach the tool just to have a tool. Always have that kind of pedagogical goal first. So our data sources. Um, teachers, we, had, we displayed their 50 images around the room. They had to walk around the room with these 50 pictures and to pick the picture that best represented themselves. Uh, and then they were, um, and they had to describe their feelings towards technology, and they wrote a brief reflection around that technology. Here's a, uh, a quick, here's four screenshots of, of the pictures. Uh, these are what we did actually eventually do is we uploaded these all to Picasa, and then suddenly Google Plus came out, and so nobody without Google Plus at the time could get on it. But what they were able to do is go in and add the comments. You see a one, a five, a two. The two, those are people who are reflected on those pictures. So we had all these pictures around the room and these teachers were running around and they're you know, looking at the pictures and telling us what, how does that really capture what, how they feel about technology integration. 
So in order to, uh, I apologize for my voice. Yeah, um, take over. yeah, if I lose my voice at some point, I'm sure many of you will be uh, very appreciative of that. Um, in order to pass through the data, we went uh, took multiple passes through. The first time we went through, we tried to identify general categories that we noticed. Uh, we created uh, catchy titles for the categories, much like you would see in, in Cosmo magazine, I guess. Uh, and we wanted to create those categories because we wanted to have a common talking place. We wanted to also, I didn't call it the Cosmo, that was one of my colleagues. Um, we wanted to have a common talking point and also bring it back to our teachers. So we had five general categories that we noticed in the data. We brought those categories back to the group of teachers and researchers we worked with. Uh, we also sent the categories out to a third party that is, you know, that knows the research, knows the field, but was not involved in our research project. And what we ultimately came up with was a continuum that we identified our teachers existing when, within. Uh, gradually, this continuum is, exi it, it's, it looks like negative to neutral to positive. But within each level of this continuum, there's different markers. So for example, someone could be in their, in their uh, description, they would indicate that they were drowning or they are overwhelmed by the amount of choices or the amount of work. Uh, some of our, our teacher participants said that this was just out of reach for them. It was their classrooms were not ideal, their students were not ideal, and our expectations were not ideal or you know, representative of their students. Uh, there was also a general, you know what, it doesn't fit into my curriculum, it's not part of the Common Core, this isn't too much to do, this is not part of my job. Um, many people have probably heard that before. Uh, there was also a neutral, that basically this was a natural progression, this is where classrooms were going. Uh, some teachers indicated that they were skeptical, but they are skeptical of everything, and they were open to new learning experiences. Some indicated that it might be hard, but they could do it. And then we had a general positive element, uh, and basically that said that you know, it was a, a positive way to reach students, that it would provide a new opportunity for students to learn, that it might be hard, but that they're flexible and they can get, they can actually accomplish it. Uh, and then just the general, they were excited. Uh, the findings, the way that it broke down from pre to post, um, obviously you would see that, you know, most of our teachers, we push them more toward the neutral and the positive when we reach the post. To me, that's not the exciting part. When we break it down based upon each one, each of the scales, Two things really stick out to me. Number one is I was uh, shocked to see that in the pre there was only two, in the post there was zero, but there weren't a lot of teachers that indicated in their descriptions all those elements that I always thought were a big issue or concern that they had, which was this isn't part of my curriculum, it's just another thing, the common core. They didn't really bring that up, and I was surprised by that. Also, uh, because dispositions and dispositions of online learning experiences is, uh, is one of my research interests, I was interested to see that uh, their definition or their explanation of themselves as being flexible learners and their ability to, they, the fact that they thought that they are resilient enough to get the work done, that moved from a, free, uh, a four to a 28 in the post-test. So we wanted to show you a couple examples of what teachers shared with us. So this is one of the examples uh, from the pre-test and then the post-test. And what the teacher said for the pre up top was, it's easy to be consumed by what we're doing that we easily miss what's happening around us. My students only know life with technology and it's time for me to hop on the train. At the pre-test, that's one of our teachers and their indication. The post-test, they said, well, it's been quite a week. My feelings are different. I'm in a hot air balloon. We had a lot of these um, general motifs of, you know, I'm, I'm ready to go and up, up and away. And, you know, I'm so excited. Tra so, yeah, travel is a big metaphor. Taking off. Yeah, there's a lot of journeys. Um, then another one of our indications, uh, the teacher started off with the swan and then moved to the surfer that's crashing. And up top, and, and th this is really a deep passage that I love, you know, that they're swimming alone in the foreground and they're looking around and they have a very old PC that's crashing and their dumb phone um, and they're not swimming in the same speed. Okay? And the swan looks tranquil and the boaters crash and splash and and, and it's very introspective. The teacher's basically like, should I get involved in this? And it, to me, in the back of my head, I'm say, you know, wondering about the teacher and the, part, the participant that comes into the New Literacies Institute and what they're thinking along the process. You know, and a lot of these people come into this program in the New Lit Institute and they're already drinking the Kool-Aid in terms of technology use. Uh, then they go into uh, the surfer crashing off the waves. They, they, they want to do so cautiously. 
Okay, they want to get on. They, they don't mind if they fall off and crash. They're just going to get up and try again. The last teacher that I wanted to share with you uh, goes from the waterfall. I flip-flopped him, the waterfall to Stonehenge. Uh, and this one was powerful as well. Uh, basically, the volume of water is too small. A lot of these teachers said that it was like trying to catch an ocean in a cup of water, um, you know, and, and that there's just too much. But then at the end, they have a sentence, you know, maybe we're not supposed to catch it all. Um, this reminds me of, you know, one thing that Don has said repeatedly is there's a whole ocean out there. It matters where you want to dip your bucket. And I've said that in these new literacy institutes is that there are too many choices as to you have to focus on your student learning objectives. But then the teacher goes to the end and they're a little bit disenfranchised. You know, they're, they're saying, you know, a lot of this is old ideas. And I'm wondering, you know, where we're going to go with it. Um, you know, I'm wondering exactly where this sort of technology will take us. Thank you, Lisa. So there's a couple, po uh, a couple po uh, points that I'd like to address in the data as we saw it. Uh, number one, and this was a little disconcerting for me as a researcher, trying to bring technology in the, into schools. There is a general view in the data that technology and technology use, at least in my eyes, as we look through the data, that technology was just this omnipresent force outside. That was just coming. And so teachers that viewed themselves as very skilled, they viewed it as, okay, I, got, I have to prepare and have to be ready for this, but it, it's coming, okay? And then teachers that were less than skilled, they thought that they were just gonna get overtaken or they, but there was never a real sense of teachers taking ownership and feeling like they could change or affect or authentically use technology. It just seemed like it was just coming and you just have to deal with it. Um, and I, I don't want my teachers in, in any of these programs to feel that way. Um, any hesitations or worries that we usually had uh, in terms of technology use in the buildings were usually eliminated by the end of the workshop. I, I, I find pride in that because a lot of our work focuses on free online tools that teachers can use because many times they don't have the teacher support in their buildings. So we try to build up an environment where they can create their own learning experiences using free online tools. Um, and then also, we saw a shift in the way that teachers thought about technology, technology use, their ability to authentically, effectively use technology in the classroom. Uh, obviously, we need much more research. We need research to continue to understand some of these trends and themes that are coming out. We need to understand what I would like to do is I'd like to take that continuum that we identified and identify specific teachers and programs and uh, basically write up case studies on each one and then understand on the individual level how these teachers are performing and what's happening on the individual level uh, as they work through like a new literacies institute or any one of these programs. Um, I'm a big believer that it's this all hinges on individual teacher dispositions. I think that is where the key is in terms of technology use, um, not a broad scale approach. We have the work products. So we'd like to take those, those teachers that were the twos to the nines. Well, did they, what did they do with their work product? And we'll show a little bit about that in the next and identify them at the beginning of the study, you know, the first week. Okay, where are you? Uh, I also think that one of the other things that, that struck me from the data was we need to identify a way to structure and scaffold our learners throughout the process. Um, and this, this goes part and parcel with the last piece, which is our need to recognize and emotionally support. This is something that came up in an earlier session, the flexibility and, uh, and persistence of our participants. We need to, on one level, at the beginning and all throughout these institutes, we need to basically identify what is the timeline, what are the structures involved, what is the scaffolding involved, where the learning will head, but then also on a day by day or minute by minute experience, when they sit there and they have struggles and they overcome them, we need to be there to pat them on the back because a lot of them are going through some huge internal <laughs> changes, you know, psychological dispositional changes and they need the support, they need us to pat them on the back along the way. That being said, anything else you want to add for that paper, sir? Just how powerful it was to use a visual analogy. Um, I encourage you, on any activity, it doesn't have to be technology, but how do you, just, how do you feel about yourself as a reader, as a writer? Do the experiment with your pre-service teachers or your students. It was, it was a very insightful exercise into who they were, especially use it as a way of looking at growth. Um, so you can basically, how do you feel about yourself and X? I, I encourage you all to try because it was a lot of fun. So you had how many pictures? 50. 
and the participants chose one of the 50 to reflect they, on yep, every, they didn't have to do the same one pre -post. and then post they chose another yes. whatever could be the same could be different yes. but it's just one okay and how, how i'm sorry it's gonna screw the time schedule how did you select the images that was my other question uh, <laughs> they had to be we found them online they just had to be like creative common license because we really pushed that um and we just found them on flickr we want to make data collection a little bit easier. What I'd like to do is have an online site where teachers can go in. I think it would be powerful learning to have an online site where the images are there well, you and, can go and they can down. leave their commentary so everyone can see um, and then build that up over time. I think it would be a nice hallmark of the program. So now they can actually go right to there for the comments right on the website. And yeah. I, I, th I think you've answered my wrong question. A different question. Oh. Wanted, uh, of that corpus, uh, did you like yeah. yeah. your like oh, like How did you go about yeah. selecting? Did they look cool? Okay. <laughs> Can that be his answer? <laughs> it, was, it was a deep psychological study of coolness. And I will say that uh, Grant gave me credit for that um, exercise, but actually, I participated in it when I went to the Center for Creative Leadership in Greensboro. And it was called the Visual Explorer, and they did it a different way. But I took their idea and adapted it mm -hmm. to this work. It's a it's a powerful piece. I, I enjoyed the the research on it. I like to continue to press it further. I, and then the final point is, we we have like the co